We are ready, dear Terry. Okay, we, great. We welcome oh. you and we are very grateful you accepted our invitation. <laughs> I'm very pleased to be invited. Um, I remember at the Kiev conference, somebody complained that um, there's so many grey haired speakers uh, who wear blue shirts and red braces. It makes the conference so boring. For heaven's sake, do something about it. But here I am again. I grew up in South London and my dad was a bus driver. There was supposed to be a number 47 bus to my school every three minutes, but sometimes 20 minutes would go by and then five buses would come at the same time. And the past 15 months has been a bit like that for books in English that criticise state education. Many go on to recommend some degree of student directed learning and curriculum choice and some advocate a context of greater regard for student voice, democracy and respect for the rights of young people. Until about 2018, I might get one or two such books a year with an invite to a book launch or a few words for the back cover. But recently, um, I, I, I've had 21 books sitting on my desk with one of my own adding to the pile and there's the pile. So get out now if you don't want to hear about them. Something is going on, but what? Are people suddenly feeling generous or wanting to send presents to this old guy as he fades away into has beenness? Well, unlikely. Or is it a tsunami of interest in our ideas building up, precipitated by a spreading awareness that most public school systems are not are just not delivering the goods economically or in terms of human flourishing? Millions of parents have just seen what uninspiring content has been sent online for their children to digest or not at home during lockdowns. And some of these will not be sending their children back to school, but many more will be ignoring the school, the school content and encouraging children to spread their interests more widely while at home. Research in England is showing that when free to choose their own reading material, Many children are choosing harder books than they would choose at school and are spending more time reading them with deeper understanding. There seems to be a growing feeling that things should not go back to being just more of the same after COVID. Now, you may be familiar with the idea of Overton Window. An Overton Window is the range of policies politically acceptable to the mainstream population at any given time. And the term is named after an American policy analyst called Joseph P. Overton. He stated that an idea's political viability depends mainly on whether it falls within this range rather than what politicians want. According to Overton, the window frames the range of policies that a politician can recommend without appearing too extreme to get elected, given the climate of public opinion at the time. Well, these windows of opportunity open and they also close as public moods swing. Around the turn of the century, I found myself uh, in such a moment where I became involved in developing education for citizenship in England. And I'd long argued for greater student participation in decision making in their curriculum and in the day to day running of schools. At the very least, I said there should be a non tokenistic students council in every school. And I'd been working with the Council of Europe in several countries along these lines, but nothing was happening in England, nothing. Suddenly, we had a new centre left government, a new minister, new advisers. It was possible to insert the word democratic in front of the word citizenship and to repeat over and over again the idea that teaching about democracy was a waste of time unless young people had the opportunity to do it. Well, it worked. Participation in democratic decision making and responsible action became a part of the English national curriculum for all 14 to 16 year olds. Money was provided for teacher training, inspectors were appointed, a large scale longitudinal research project was funded and 25% of our secondary schools implemented the policy with enthusiasm and the general support of parents, though many schools did not. But what happened was the right wing press challenged the development in 2001, claiming it would undermine standards in important subjects like mathematics, and this worried some parents. The minister panicked and I was funded to research the issue. I found evidence that far from undermining standards, 
Schools that involve large numbers or all their students in school democracy actually achieved better examination results, had better attendance and fewer exclusions for bad behaviour than the average for all schools in similar socioeconomic areas. It became known as the Hannum Report and it's still available. My findings were supported by a further study carried out by our National Foundation for Education Research in 2006. So, great, but by 2010, the public mood had shifted and we had a new Conservative government and these democratic developments in school came to a total stop. The nightmare of competition between schools, obsessive testing, high levels of anxiety and loss of well-being in students and their teachers, this came back and the Overton window for school democracy had firmly closed. Well. Now, 12 years later, as I stare at this pile of books on my desk, I wonder if another Overton window is opening. They include a spectrum of authors um, from those on the more creative and reflective parts of the mainstream establishment to those who are well outside it. And those who worked within state systems as responsible subversives and those who've created pioneers of possibility ventures in the private sector those whose principal focus is with learning and those who are more concerned with human rights. The pile does not include wonderful texts such as Peter Gray's Free to Learn or Ken Robinson's Creative School or Yakov Hecht's Democratic Education, Peter Hartkamp's Beyond Coercive Education or any of the Sudbury books or anything by David Gribble that predate these recent arrivals. So where to start? Well, I don't know if you can see this, the flood started with the arrival without explanation of an extraordinary text called Edu Shifts, The Future of Education Is Now. And this arrived just before Christmas in 2019. I have no idea who sent it to me and it contains no publication date or place. It should have a code number in it, but it hasn't. And after an introduction futuristically written in 2184 by Philip Greer, who, like many Austrians, probably achieved longevity from the uh, mountain air of their childhood, um, the book contains a chapter two, which consists of 20 blank pages, which should, but don't, contain the handwritten thoughts of whoever sent me the book, together with an instruction to add my own ideas before I pass it on but it's a brilliant book, which I think started its life at a conference in Brazil in 2017. Why it took so long to arrive in Seaford, UK, I don't know, but the sections by Helena Singer from Brazil, the neurobiologist Gerald Reuter from Germany, Jose Pacheco from Portugal and Brazil and Yakov Hecht from Israel, they all contain transformative visions of what education should and hopefully will become pretty much what members of UDEC would wish for. Well, so far I've been too possessive to pass it on as I keep rereading it. I'll get my, my own book out of the way next. It's called Another Way is Possible, Becoming a Democratic Teacher in a State School. It's all about what Henry was talking about. I, I, my ideal was A.S. Neal and my dream school was Summerhill. I tried to take it into an English secondary school. <coughs> It's all about the um, student directed learning in a context of democracy and human rights. Well, as a young teacher, my first job, I tried to create a Summerhill inspired democratic learning community of 35 11 year olds who just failed the high stakes 11 plus test in an English secondary school. I was kicked into finally getting in, into publication as an ebook and now a paperback by Katie Zago and Max Sauber from Ali, the uh, Association Luxembourgoise pour la Liberté d'Instruction, or something like that. I'm eternally grateful to them because I've had feedback now from student teachers in eight countries saying they've been encouraged by the ideas which were lacking in their university courses. Well, most closely aligned with my own book is Geraldine Rose, It's Our School, It's Our Time. She's an English educational psychologist who, for her PhD, studied examples of teachers who systematically involve children in class and school decision making. Like my book, 
It's aimed at helping state school teachers resist damaging academic performance pressure. The book is for those in state systems working in a gradualist fashion to enhance learning through participation, but it's nonetheless firmly committed to children's rights, and it was a real pleasure to be invited to attend the launch of her book and to review it. One of the reviewers of my book sent his magnum opus from the United States. Wayne Jennings has been the founder and principal of a number of influential participative alternative charter schools in the Minneapolis St. Paul area of Minnesota. His book, School Transformation, here it is. As you can see, it's of biblical proportions. <laughs> piecemeal, piecemeal reforms are not good enough, he believes. Schools that ignore human differences can't possibly prepare young people for uncertain futures. The book is a magnificent summary of all that we know about learning, creativity and the failure of existing school systems to foster them. It has the elegance and breadth of vision of Peter Gray and Ken Robinson. The most telling parts of the book for me is Wayne's demolition of the hypocrisy of school mission statements. They claim to prepare for the future workplace, but they allow little autonomy, communication, collaboration or control. They claim to prepare democratic citizens, but most schools are run as dictatorships with little voice for students or teachers. They claim to prepare for lifelong learning, but all, all too often destroy the love of learning of all young humans. They claim to develop the potential every child of every child, but they don't bother to find out what that potential is. Well, this all resonated with my work as a school inspector, and I think Wayne Jennings' book is wonderful. Anyway, days after it arrived, another wonderful book came through the post, Get Out of the Way and Let Kids Learn, by Carl Rust from Indiana, also from the United States. Carl sets out how we can transform schools and re reintroduce natural learning. Like me, he describes his own learning journey, which is fascinating. The book's a down-to-earth practical guide for teachers in mainstream schools on how to start the process. I was recently in a meeting with Carl, listening to a complex theoretical exposition. At question time, he asked, so what do we do on Monday morning? His book contains a whole lot of answers. Get out of the classroom, get rid of tests, get rid of coercion, get rid of much teacher talk, Get rid of a one-size-fits-all curriculum. Bring in student-directed learning and democratic decision-making. It's a lovely book, and I really hope it becomes a bestseller. Anyway, shortly after reading my book, a retired teacher trainer sent me a copy of The Futility of School Reform by John Pierce. It's another great read. And in it, he demolishes conventional subject-based curriculum, most of what passes for teaching, and school as an organisation committed to control. He believes that through social media, young people are seeing that school is more and more concerned with control rather than learning. And they're beginning to challenge the much of their prescribed curriculum for what they see as important and interesting areas of knowledge. Greta Thunberg inspired climate change movements around the world such as the Teach the Future movement in the UK and rights demanding groups such as Pupil Power, also in the UK, Teach the Teacher program in Australia, Up for Learning in Vermont, USA, Vermont, excuse me, Obesu and the national school student organisations in Europe, the Global Youth X Youth Campaign, they all bear witness and of course um, what Richard Fransom is doing now all bear witness to John Pierce's beliefs, and he concludes with his vision of the optimum school based on community rather than hierarchy, which is liberatory rather than controlling. Again, just about everything UDEC stands for. Well, next, I'm off to the Netherlands for Humankind, A Hopeful History by Rutger Bregman. Zoe Redhead says that sceptical visitors to Summerhill Summer Hill, often refer to William Golding's dystopian novel Lord of the Flies, where a, a group of children stranded on an island soon forget their civilised behaviour 
and start to murder and seek power over each other. Well, no, says Zoe, that is not how self-governed kids behave. And I agree with her completely. And Bregman sets out in his book Why We're Right, demonstrating that collaborative kindness rather than hatred is crucial to being human. He tells a true story of children shipwrecked on an island who develop behaviours totally the reverse of Golding's and much more aligned to Summerhill. When in the Netherlands, it's worth mentioning, by the way, that Baz Rosenbrand's beautiful book, Co-Create School with the Children, A New Morning, has just emerged in its third edition. I haven't got a copy of the third edition, but if it's as good as the first, it'll be wonderful. Well, moving east, my next book comes from Bavaria, Germany. It's called Education is an Admirable Thing, Wake Up Call by Charles Walkup. Charles was one of the core group of adults behind the beautiful Amazo Sudbury School near Munich, brutally closed by the Bavarian inspectors, despite the vocal support of parents and the local Burgermeister. I was invited to join their support group along with Peter Gray and Peter Hart Camp and Jakob Hecht, but we were unable to save the school, so it was wonderful to hear from Monica that it's still going strong. They haven't given up. Charles' book is more inner or spiritual, perhaps, than the others described so far, but he also aims to transform German schooling to one more concerned for sustainability. What he calls cross-pollinated learning, with adults and young people together creating curriculum and defining what both regard as useful knowledge. It's another great book. I'm rereading it right now. Back to the USA for two books that support the 20% concept, the idea that 20% of curriculum time in all state schools should be allocated to the interests, concerns, questions and passions of the students. Of course, in democratic schools, 20% is a ridiculously small amount of time for student-directed learning, but for the majority of state schools everywhere, it will be a, will be a big step forward. Uh, Esther Wojcicki is the author of this how to Raise Successful People. She also heads the media art department at Palo Alto High School in California, where she's for many years implemented the 20% principle with her classes to amazingly good effect. Her catchword is trick, trust, respect, independence, collaboration, and kindness. Bajitsky's book is perhaps as much about parenting as schooling, but one of her students, who was also one of her daughters, went on to join Google, where the 20% principle operates. And there she created some of the most profitable innovations for the company in her self-directed but paid time. And on the same topic, Kevin Brookhauser's little book, also from California, The 20 Time Project, How Educators Can Launch Google's Formula for Future Ready Innovation, this arrived on my desk at the same time as Wojcicki's book, and it's a roadmap of how to implement the 20% principle in lessons and in whole school scheduling. It's a practical Carl Rust-like what to do on Monday morning kind of book. As somebody commented to me last week, when we create 20% departments in all state schools, we should call them passion departments. I love that. And I'm beginning to hear more and more places around the world where it's being tried, even here in the UK. Well, now I want to come to a book by a young person. Uh, but I can't see it in my pile. Oh, yes, I can. Here it is. It's called We're Trying to Do Things Differently by Freya Acheron, who was a Summerhill student herself. She's now doing a PhD at London University, but she's teaching on the uh, BA Social Studies course. And she and her students decided to write a book together about the challenges of relationship and recognition in higher education. And this book comes at a time when undergraduate students in universities in England are amassing enormous debt for which they get poorer and poorer value in the teaching as staff are pressed to focus on publication and research. It asks questions that would be transformative if they were taken seriously. How to foreground democratic partnership and emotional care. How to define the role of free speech in a university. How to turn the research lens onto the experience of undergraduate learning itself. 
One of the amazing things about this book, which is why I recommend it, is that it's free. You can get it as an ebook or a paperback free of charge. Well, remaining in the UK with a diversion to South Africa, I come to three fine books on self-directed learning, which together constitute an extremely powerful package. First, clinical psychologist and parents, Naomi Fisher's Changing Our Minds. How children can take control of their own learning. Here's a magnificent compendium of knowledge around what neuroscience and psychological research have to tell us about the potential children have to organize their own learning and the almost complete failure of school systems to use this knowledge. The book is a Bible of guidance and reassurance for parents considering home education, for example. I attended her book launch and wrote a blurb for the book, but I'd never met Naomi in the flesh, although I had met her children when they attended Ramin Frahangi's Sudbury Model School in Paris, L'Ecole Dynamique. Naomi says that she was delighted and surprised when Peter Gray agreed to write a preface for her book. Well, I understand her delight as Peter writes, we're on a trajectory with self-directed education, my Boston accent. I don't know when the gates will open, but this book will help. Well, I'm not surprised that he valued it highly and agreed to contribute. Wonderful book, Changing Our Minds, Naomi Fisher. Well, Naomi no longer lives in France, and now she sends her kids to the College of Self-Managed Learning in Brighton in the south of England, which is associated with the author of my next book, um, Ian Cunningham. And his book is Self-Managed Learning and the New Educational Paradigm. Ian suggests that to be qualified to comment on the failures of school systems and to convincingly propose alternatives, you need to have skin in the game, to be a player. Well, since coordinating the alternative inspection of Summerhill School 20 years ago, which played a key role in its defence, incidentally, his skin in the game has been the creation of a learning centre for young people in the Brighton area of South England. And Ian uses the experience gained from creating self-management in higher education and in company training to create a college of self-managed learning for home educated kids. Unlike most of the other privately funded alternative education settings, he has no interest in becoming a school or, or subjecting his college to the attentions of the inspection system. Though his team have run some highly successful programs in mainstream schools. Inspectors have arrived unannounced on several occasions and departed somewhat culture shocked but silenced. If, and if there is a distinction to be made between self-managed and self-directed learning or between learning or education, it's probably to be made around Ian's concept of learning groups and the role of adults. As far as the young people are concerned, however, they're free to discover and pursue their own interests and goals at their own pace. This is the new education paradigm to replace existing authoritarian, coercive, prescriptive and involuntarily tested schooling. Well, now to stay on the subject of self-directed education, I'm going to whiz south to South Africa to find Gianna Clements' wonderful books. They're called Helping the Butterfly Hatch, Books One and Book Two. They're quite thin, so I'm counting them as one book in my pile. And book one is about the what and why of self-directed education, SDE, and book two covers the how, the support learners can obtain from adults and each other as they engage on their learning adventures. The books are strongly rights-based and not just concerned with learning. Gianna quotes Ken Danford of North Star, Massachusetts, learning is natural, school is optional. And as with Ian Cunningham, she's founded a learning community and she avoids calling it a school. It's Sudbury modelled, but it's called Riverstone Village. You can be captured by the creative inspiration of Gianna's books by reading 20% of them free on Smashwords, but then go and buy the paperbacks. Production was once again supported by Katie and Max from Ali Asby in Luxembourg. Well, I want to shoot on to Australia now for Keith Heggett's new book, Activist Citizenship Education, a Framework for Creating Just Citizens. 
In the noughties, I was involved in developing citizenship education in the UK, led by ministerial advisor Bernard Crick. A raft of interesting books emerged, one by John Potter in the UK or James Eunice in the States or Joel Westheimer in Canada, for example. So I was delighted to be invited to Keith Heddock's virtual book launch, as he is firmly in the if you want kids to understand democracy, then they've got to do it in the everyday life of the school and not just listen to teachers talk about it. And then they've got to go out of school and do it in the community as well. Unfortunately, the price is $120 Australian, a bit of a deterrent, but I'll lend my copy to anyone who's interested. So that's Keith Haggart. Back to the UK now with um, a book called Making Education Fit for Democracy, Closing the Gap. I couldn't work out why Rutledge, the publisher, had sent me a review copy, as at first sight this book looked very dry and academic. I couldn't find out much about the author either, Brenda Watson. But one of the back cover blurbs was written by Matthew Taylor, who runs, had run the left-leaning think tank IPPR, for which I'd done some work. That caught my eye. I'm glad it did. It is, in fact, one of a number of books beginning to emerge from mainstream establishment places that radically challenge existing school systems. And they're beginning to speak our language, folks. She writes, persons should be at the heart of education, not content. Schools should resemble well-run libraries. I would like to see learning villages created where self-directed learning could be encouraged. This is coming from the heart of the mainstream. Two more books have just arrived from mainstream sources. Retired head teacher and inspector Mina Woods and head teacher Nick Haddon have written a book called The Secondary Curriculum Transformed, Enabling All to Achieve. Well, you can't get mainstream than English head teachers and inspectors, but they too are moving in our direction. Their critique of the status quo is really powerful, though their remedies are less so. But they also refer to the need for some 20%, I wonder, self-directed time in schools. The second book of this pair is by Tony Breslin, one time chief, chief uh, executive officer of the UK Citizenship Foundation. And his new book is almost up to date with the title Lessons from Lockdown, the Educational Legacy of COVID-19. And it's based on hundreds of interviews with students, teachers, parents and administrators about what has changed during the lockdowns. Once again, there are numerous references to the need for more self-directed learning and listening to student voice to avoid returning to the same old pre-COVID prescribed regime of narrow academic content and endless testing. Well, I know Tony and he's a good guy. We work together on the citizenship project, but he's very much mainstream. And here he is talking about narrow academic content, the need to get rid of it, and the need to get rid of endless testing. This says something. The last book in the pile, and perhaps the most provocative, is Zach Stein's, Zachary Stein's, Education in a Time Between Worlds, Essays on the Future of Schools, Technology and Society. I'm reading it alongside James Moffat's 25-year-old The Universal School Schoolhouse which is another wonderful book. Stein sees civilization uh, in a state of collapse, now at a, a planetary level for the first time, not just at the, the level of the Mayan civilization or the Greek or the Roman, but now we've got the whole planet facing collapse. This was predicted by Moffat 25 years ago and written about by Stein. Stein's very aware of the contribution of climate change and that exploitative late capitalism, whether of the US, European or Chinese variety, is finally running up against a world of finite resources. Stein sees the old institutions, such as education systems, as being beyond reform. If we are fortunate, empathetic and smart enough, we can avoid accelerating inequality, war and extinction to create abundance in education, energy and everything else. The Stein envisages the new emerging from the fringes of the old. Things like UDEC, you could say, or unschooling school, emerging from the fringes of the old, but 
carrying the message out of which the new will be created. So he talks about a new combination of locally grounded but globally connected learning hubs instead of schools, where self-directed education in democratic and rights respecting contexts can be freely available to all of all ages, not dissimilar to Moffat's Universal Schoolhouse. In fact, I'm surprised that Moffat's book does not appear in Stein's bibliography. In many respects, this vision reflects that of the English community education movement, of which I was a part in the 1980s and about which I'm now writing a book. We envisaged, those of us running schools at, at that time, we envisaged our schools becoming community learning centres, where town and school would become a kind of seamless opportunity for each to be a resource for the other. And in my school, we had adults in, in examination classes, particularly who wanted to learn foreign languages before going on holiday or something like that. It had an extraordinary effect on the kids to have granny studying French in the back of their classroom. Yakov's Hecht's Education Cities also develops this idea. And many of Stein's themes linked to the idea I was struggling to express in my keynotes at, at the Crete and Kiev UDEC conferences, where I argued that self-directed democratic education would be crucial preparation for a world where individual lives could no longer find their purpose and identity just in careers of full-time paid employment. Stein gives this kind of thinking a coherence that I lacked, frankly. He sets out 13 social miracles for educational abundance. Now, these include some that I did refer to, such as universal basic income, and some that I didn't, like world disarmament and mutual recognition of shared humanity to replace extremism in the world's religions. I think Stein and Moffat are rediscovering the perennial philosophy popular, popularised after the Second World War by Aldous Huxley. Anyway, that's it. That's my pile of books, and I hope you'll give some of them a try. Uh, you can have a copy of this talk with bibliographies of all the books I've mentioned, publication dates, etc., etc., if you want it. Perhaps, collectively, they do indicate an Overton window, allowing educational policy to move towards the paradigm shift that many of my authors talk about and that we're all working for in UDEC. So I'd like to close by sharing a connected issue. Despite bad news from France, in England, two seriously radical state schools, like the Agora schools in the Netherlands, and at least six new democratic private ventures have emerged recently. I'm also very encouraged by the UDEC Erasmus project that Maggie from Bulgaria has been talking about, bringing together democratic schools and state primary schools in Belgium, Bulgaria, Italy and Spain. And I've long believed that this dialogue between pioneers of possibility, private democratic schools and our state systems is the way forward for the benefit of all young people and not just those from rich families. So am I right? I'd like to have a bit of chat about this. I nearly finished. Am I right to be concerned by the emergence of the Acton Academies? I don't know how many of you have heard of them. It's a chain of for-profit franchised schools and they feature self-directed learning and a degree of democratic decision making. The first outside the USA is now running in Ottawa, Canada, and the first in Europe is about to be created in Guildford, England, scheduled to open in September. The English owners presently run expensive elitist conventional private schools. Now, if you join the Acton franchise, you have to pay a fairly substantial fee for which you get access to the brand, the learning materials, promotional literature and videos and handbooks to use to set up your school and train your teachers. But you're then expected to return a proportion of your fee income back to Acton Center in Austin, Texas, in exchange for which you gain access to the community of practice. You share ideas with other Acton schools. I mean, one of the, uh, the ideas I might share would be why the hell am I sending money back to Austin, Texas? But that's just me. The first Acton Academy was set up for the best of possible reasons, 
by parents who were unhappy with what they saw on offer for their children in the public schools of Texas. Now, these parents just happened to be from a business school background, and they also saw an Overton window opening, a gap in the market. I think this is very interesting. But what do they see in this gap of the market? What do they see through the Overton window? They see self-directed education in schools that are focused on democracy and respect for human rights. So if that's what these business people are seeing and they're setting up a franchise to sell it, that seems quite interesting. I would probably be pleased for my grandchildren to attend an Acton Academy. And anyway, you could say, Summerhill, Sands, Sudbury Valley, Netzwerk, L'Ecole Dynamique, they all charge fees. So what's the problem? But I have this niggling fear when for profit is the motive for starting and franchising a democratic model. Am I right to fear that those self-directed and even democratic and rights respecting this for profit franchised model will keep fees high and ensure that the entitlement of all children to a creative experience moves further and further towards the impossible? enhancing social division and inequality as a result. Is this approach then of franchised democratic schools part of the problem rather than part of the way forward? Democratic self-directed creative schools for the wealthy few and coercive day prisons for the rest? Or am I just an unreconstructed lefty who needs a bit more Dewey and pragmatism in his mindset? Thanks for listening. I've done. I hope we can get some discussion going though around this idea of private democratic schools. Over to you. Thanks, Mara. Dear Gary, thank you so much. It's been so interesting. I don't know how can we get the list. You haven't sent it to me via email, have you? I'll send it now. Okay. I didn't send it to you beforehand. I wanted to keep it secret till I give my talk. Okay, because I've been taking my notes here, but uh, you were so fast, I did not have time for everything. Look, the whole talk I can send you as a text. I always do this because however slow I go, people say, have you got a copy of the text? So I've got a copy pretty much of what I've just said, and it includes lists of all the books that I referred to. That would be perfect. I would put it as a comment in the YouTube channel for everyone to see, and we can send it in the newsletter too. Uh, although I see Sydney just put uh, almost all of them in the chat. What list is this, Sydney? Yeah, I just thought I'd put that in the chat just in case we didn't get to a list from Derry. So it doesn't yeah. have doesn't have all the authors, but it's got most of the titles. Yep. Thank You'll you get so everything much. in the list. I mean, I don't know. Can you, Deck, um, uh, put this on UDEC's website? so that it becomes a, a link and I can send it to other people. Um, I yes, might ask Progressive Education, Jo Symes in the UK, if she'll put it on her website and then it acquires a sort of internet presence and I can send the link to other people. Or if there's anyone else could do that, that would be great. Yeah, I think we have a list of books anyway in the web page. And if we don't, it's a good time to create one, a list of suggested books. So we're going to start with your list, Derry. OK, great. I will go harass uh, Gillen and Marco to do the work for the web page. I'm Why good not? at harassing people. Uh, we have um, seven minutes for four. Oh, come on. No, yeah, I'm not, I, you, I've got at least 15 minutes. Anyway, don't let's argue. I went as fast as I could. Fast question. I thought I got an hour. It looks like Gabrielle's got his hand up. I don't know if he, he has a question. It looks like I do. I can't find the hand. All right. I have Gabrielle and then Sydney and then Milton. Quick question to, to Derry. Do you know if, the, if this schools and when it comes to the question of sovereignty, how they manage, like, um, for example, uh, hiring teachers of the organization like is it um, directed from above or how it when, how is it about democratic structures when it comes to the organization i think the actual i've probably been a bit unkind to acton 
I mean, you, ha you have to pay a fairly substantial startup fee in order to use the brand. But once you've paid that, I think it's about 16,000 American dollars. But once you've paid that, um, you then get going and they provide you with quite a lot of stuff to help you get started. And the actual hiring and firing and running of your own school, setting of your own fee structure and all that is absolutely down to the local school. But what is required is that 3% of the fee income is sent back to head office in Austin, Texas. Are you okay, Gabriel, Sydney, and then Mirto, and then Charlie? I guess, Daria, you and I have talked about this question about privatizing democratic schools before, and I just wonder if it has any relationship to the whole notion of greenwashing that's going on with climate change. The idea that many corporations will find a way to look green and make lots of money off of the transition. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, the good news was that uh, if we're looking for, is there an Overton window coming for our ideas about what education is all about or should be all about. It seems to me if a commercial company is beginning to see mileage and uh, room for investment um, in backing these ideas, then probably something seriously is going on. They've recognized the market. Well, if there's a market, it's up to us to get into it too, it seems to me. Thank you. I have Mirto, and then it was Charlie. Go ahead, Mirto. I have a question, or maybe it's just my idea about um, what do you think about remote education, on education, online education? Because we're so fed up with the authoritative conventional education in Greece, we thought it couldn't get any worse. And then e -edu electronic education came. On because of COVID, supposedly, you know, education via Zoom with no contact between pupils and teachers. So, you know, it was like the end of the, the world kind of thing with no communication whatsoever. And the well, authorities were even worse. And the other, I, other thing, sorry. Yes, the other thing you mentioned about the, I think it's the market forces generally who are more sensitive to changes in, in society because they have more to gain. Like this is happening with birth centers in Greece with home, like home birth uh, centers. And the, the uh, public sector does not understand anything. They can't see that natural birth, you know, non-medicated birth is more profitable for the state. They, they like close their eyes and their ears, but they market the private uh, institutions. They are more sensitive to that. I'm not saying this is good. Um, I actually think it's dangerous as well. But you know, this is how it works. <laughs> yes, it's part of the energy, isn't it? And uh, I, I'm all in favour of entrepreneurialism. It's just that I prefer to see quite a bit of it as uh, social entrepreneurialism. Um, and uh, so I, and I, I'm not actually opposed to profit. But your, your comments are interesting. I mean, I think in terms of online learning, an awful lot of it has been dreadful. And in England, certainly, it's made some parents aware of just how absurd the stuff the kids have to do at school is particularly in primary schools where kids are learning aspects of English grammar that most English teachers can't understand. So there's some crazy stuff going on. And the online learning has made that clear to parents. On the other hand, there's been some very innovative online learning going on. If you look at what OutSchool in the States has been doing, it's very creative. It's also for profit. But I think an awful lot of state schools could learn an awful lot from the way OutSchool organizes its courses around the interests of the kids. Thank you, Derry. Now Thank we you. have Charlie and then Henry and then me, please. Um, thank you, Derry, for the for the very inspiring um, presentation of all these books. It invites to definitely sit and, and take some readings and, and also for the opinions. I actually, what you are talking about and the question that you proposed, I saw it uh, clearly in Spain while I was doing my PhD. Um, there are a couple of, of democratic schools, so they call themselves, uh, which have adopted the IBO program or the United States um, uh, curriculum. And they are accepted as international schools. And they also have to pay, this is for profit, they send part of the fees 
to these organizations every year. Um, I feel that, uh, yeah, of course, it is elitist. And, and uh, you know, as you say, um, either uh, entrepreneurs or you know, people in, with, with the means to, to um, afford it are looking for a head start for their children. I feel that that is a fact that we cannot just escape from that. It will continue happening. Now, the point is how to start merging and, and, and influencing somehow. Uh, the public schools, the kindergartens, especially teacher um, teacher training. Um, I feel that th there is an awful lot to do on, on that matter. If we are not addressing the uh, um, teacher students, uh, we might not have a chance to really modify something of what happens in conventional schools. So my point is that we ne just need to live together. It is happening. I com completely agree. It's a danger. Um, how do we address it from bringing the possibilities to the people who cannot afford private educational possibilities, right? So yeah, all my support and thank you, Larry, always inspiration. Well, I've, I'm quite a believer in memes. <clears throat> I mean, you kindly quoted one of mine in your opening talk <clears throat> on Friday, Charlie, when I think you said, well, what, what, talking about my own experience of school, that learning about democracy and human rights when I was school was like reading holiday brochures in prison. Now, that one I hear coming back to me quite often from different people around the world. And I've got another one. Uh, how about creative schools for the rich, day prisons for the poor? I find that one certainly gets discussion going wherever you throw it. And I, I'm a great believer in memes, short statements that you can plant into people's minds that get them thinking. I'm probably talking like a PR consultant, but I think it's quite important that we're clever about this. The advertisers commercially are pretty clever at it. I think we've got to get clever. Thank you, Gary. It's Henry and then me. Yeah. Um... It's a, it's a very interesting, always, thank you, Derry, for your talk. Love you lots and uh, lovely to see you again. Um, I, find that, I find that, the you know, that we've, uh, Derry, we've seen this whole thing of the free school movement in England, the privatisation of education. And, and the fact that then now, it's, it does really concern me that the fact that what they're going to be starting to create that competition around is to do with children's rights and freedom and those things that actually the well-being of children uh, uh, should should be the sort of standard. I mean, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a scary thing that that find, whether, whether creating of competition will mean that there will then be, um, you know, the lowering of prices and all of these sort of things. But the fact that actually um, the the values that we're talking to talking about are going to be the financial selling point of education. Uh, I, I find it I find it very 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 concerning whether that will lead uh, eventually to the fact that people are realizing that that is something that is that is such an important thing for um, uh, uh, childhoods and for well-being for for, for for children but the idea that then that's going to actually be based around money is a very very concerning thing and I'm not too sure I don't know if I like the idea that it's going to just create more and more competition and then if that's the case potentially more and more problems I think if anything well, as you know, Henry, I've always made an exception for the democratic schools that exist because they want to prove that education can be done this way. And this is why I use the expression pioneers of possibility. I don't believe your granddad started Summerhill to make money. It's an absurd idea. And most of the people I know who start democratic schools do it because they believe it's right to give kids very often starting with their own kids because they're sick of what they see in the state schools or even the expensive private schools. They're doing it because they believe in it. Now, the trouble with Acton is the people who started it believed in it as well, but they happen to see an opportunity in the market. And that's where it starts to worry me. <clears throat> I want to see schools like Summerhill as inspirations for changing the state system. Eventually, I'd even, I know your mum wouldn't be happy about it, but I'd be happy to see Summerhill incorporated and funded as part of the state system, like the democratic schools in Israel. But for the time being, 
we don't want to let the existing state anywhere near it, which is why I stuck up for your school in the court case. Thank you. There it's me and then Gabrielle, and I don't see anyone else raising their hand so far. I just wanted to say very simplified and poorly and coming from my own experience, because everything is suppressed in my country, that I understand very well the, um, this concern. Uh, for me now, as a parent, I would take anything. All the democratic schools I know, nobody is rich from the school. Um, all the democratic schools I know have been just trying and a lot of them struggling just to stay sustainable, just to be able to go on. And I, I am very, very often wondering what Bruno wrote in the chat, if there is, there could be a connection between the uh, neoliberal uh, movement, how to say that, with democratic education, neoliberal ideas align somehow with democratic education. This is something we very often discuss if this could be the case. Uh, I, I cannot, I, it looks like to me that this, this cannot happen. I don't know if it would ever happen. And in every country that there are no democratic schools, I would very much try and applaud the, the creating of democratic schools. Maybe we should wonder again if, if this is a global discussion because the, the conditions are different. Like in England, where you have democratic schools for more than 100 years, why haven't you been able to apply this way, this method to the public schools and make that accessible? The people who are, who are funding democratic schools, they are not the people who have invented the, the social uh, and the economical discrimination. They just live in this world. I don't know if I'm making any sense. My English is very poor. Thank you. Some of us have done it in the public schools. You know, this book's quite cheap. I really recommend it. <laughs> But I, something Henning's just put in the chat is interesting, that the, there have to be alternatives that aren't just uh, creative schools for the rich and day prisons for the poor. And if you read Zach Stein's book, the idea of um, community learning hubs, this is exactly what we were trying to do in the community schools movement 30 years ago, um, to create schools that were very much run by their local communities, for their local communities, by their local communities. Absolutely. And if Stein is right, and we're, we're going to face breakdowns of our nation state forms of organising things, and we're also going to see a breakdown of capitalism, then the idea of schools emerging out of local communities and the needs of local communities, while at the same time being connected beyond the level of the nation state, actually being globally connected. That's an exciting possibility. Local schools globally connected. Thank you. Gabrielle and then Sydney. And, and isn't that the idea of the libertarian schools, as I heard a little bit, I don't know so much about it, libertarian schools which come out of the anarchist movement. I've been in contact with a um, person here, which is like out of this anarchist movement of self-organized uh, communities and the uh, educational way. Maybe Charlie knows about more, and I think Sasa also mentioned libertarian education, but this is obviously one of the central dilemmas of our movement and a very reasonable critic to the, have this elitist um, mechanisms. And I think this is the, the what you just said, Derry, the, of these local communities. I think this is what libertarian schools or education pretend, isn't it? As a, education as a political act. And Evangel Evangelos is having a chat on the open space about community, uh, what community learning, autonomous communities, education, autonomous, autonomous communities. Communication, yes. We're just getting a comment in the chat from um, 
from De Ramte School in the Netherlands um, pointing out something I'm very, very aware of, that once you accept state funding, you also accept state control if you're not careful because they'll always say, oh, well, it's taxpayers money and it's got to be accounted for. So accountability always raises its head. And we've got to have answers to that, that if we're going to preserve the uh, independence and at the same time take the money, that's going to be a tricky one. But it is being done all around the world, including uh, De, Va De Valle's school in the Netherlands, which was in the school circles film. Thank you, it's Sydney, and then Catherine, and then Charlie, and I think we're ready to close after this. Uh, well, I think Derry hit it right on the nose. Uh, it's, it's think globally, act locally, but not in the way that corporations do. Even if you listen to Clayton Christensen's theory of disruptive innovation that he applied to education, we can still disrupt the marketplace, and I have mixed feelings about the marketplace, obviously. Um, we can still disrupt the marketplace with locally based entrepreneurial efforts to create community schools that are not run by corporations, but are run by local communities. So I think we just have to make a distinction between you know, where entrepreneurialism gets out of control and where it stays in the local environment. Um, because if we didn't, you know, none of us would be on this call if we didn't have corporations to thank for our computers, right? We wouldn't have created these devices by ourselves in the local community. Yeah. So we just have to be careful how we look at entrepreneurial efforts and make sure that the ones that are about people and education and, and uh, connectedness are, are, are locally based. Yeah, that's great, Sydney. thank you. And I, I, I think we have some models from the high-tech computer community um, we have some models of people act, actually creating wonderful things and then giving them away, actually giving them to empower local people, to empower us all. I mean, I know that's not how Bill Gates has run his program. No. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, there are people in the high tech community who do think in that way. I'm glad to say. Thank you. Now, Catherine and then Charlie, and we have to close this circle of discussion. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you, Derry. It's really interesting. But I'm just thinking, like, for England in in general, is the reason that the government kind of freed um, academies from the national curriculum is because they know that the democratic model is appealing um, as well, like, because there's a market for it and their agenda is to basically... Um, turn all schools into academies like what are we gonna how do you stop that from happening well, you know like how can you... sorry that's lovely lovely to hear a yorkshire voice from from uh lancashire. From UK. oh lancashire oh my god <laughs> she'll switch me off immediately Don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> no no but the, the fact oh, I don't is mind. i'm not part of the war of the roses two of, the, two, of, two of the most interesting um, state schools in England have been created as free schools, it, 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 not the academy program exactly, but free schools, though one of them has now formed an academy chain. Um, that's the XP school in Doncaster and uh, School 21 in London, uh, who, interestingly enough, a bunch of young people from School 21 are making a film about me as an inspector, which is a slightly frightening prospect. But um, the fact is, these two most progressive state schools have exploited the possibilities of moving away from the national curriculum. They're still subjected to inspection by Ofsted, unfortunately, but there are, they're beginning to educate people at Ofsted who are beginning to see that within some interesting parameters, I mean, they're not democratic schools, but they've moved a long way. They've got project based learning. They've got the kids involved in decision making at every level of school decision making. And there are a few primary schools also. So there's some possibilities within our system for flexibility, but not much. I mean, the big thing we've got to get rid of is the inspection system and then the national curriculum. And once those are gone, we can then encourage more innovation. 
Um, but there's not much sign, unfortunately, yet of people seeing market potential in these alternative approaches to learning. There's enough of it happening to be exciting and encouraging, but I wouldn't say yet in England they were really opening the Overton window that I was talking about, but you can see signs of hope, that's for sure. Thank you, Derry. And the last question or opinion would be from Charlie. Uh, thank you, Maro. No, actually, well, I think that Derry and, and, and the other participants have already gone into that. There are these uh, restrictions, these uh, compromises. When we get uh, support from the state, we leave this situation in, in, in our small branch. Um, I feel that um, there have to be compromises. You know, we are uh, supporting more inclusion. Uh, children are feeling it positively, emotionally feeling it. Um, we are providing support, but at the same time, we need to engage in some um, regulatory uh, uh, teaching learning processes about certain topics and certain subjects. Um, the idea of, of, of analyzing democratic education and, and libertarian education, I think that there are many simi similarities there. Definitely. Uh, anarchism is, is um, all about self-regulation, the, the abolition of authoritarianism or authorities per se, um, and, and democratic schools uh, you know, rely on, on distributive leadership. So I believe that there are many, many points of where, where we cross, but uh, definitely I just wanted, I was totally agreeing with the position that if we get into the public sector, we had to get to compromises and we have to limit the scope of our objectives. And yet, just to finish, the public sector is where the kids are. In my country, 93% of the kids are in the public sector. So we can't just think about what's best for the 7%. We've got to take what we know is creatively working in the private sector and transfer it into the state sector. And if we've got enough of a wind of public opinion behind us, <clears throat> Then the, the, the politicians, this is the whole idea of the Overton window, <clears throat> the politicians will po follow public opinion. So it's partly our responsibility to try and mould public opinion. And my last comment, Mara, is that the IDEC in Kathmandu, the virtual one, unfortunately, we were talking about schools within schools, which we haven't discussed here, but it's very much what Charlie's doing in Tallinn. And, uh, this uh, Danish academic said to me, he said, you know, Charlie's school in Tallinn, Sulamai, Summerhill, is probably the most exciting piece of innovation that's going on in Europe right now, because it is showing us how we can move the ideas of Summerhill into the state system. So a last word of congratulations to Charlie. Keep it up, mate. You're doing a fantastic job. Yes. Thank you very much. I'm getting stressed with how we are six minutes over time. Thank you also very much, especially Derry, for the for the so much inspiring talk.